then give some uh, some of the um, open questions in the field. And I'm also looking forward to your questions. You can also feel free to, to interrupt me during the talk as well and ask questions. Okay. Uh, so everyone knows this slide. Uh, neural networks have been responsible for the state of the art in many areas, but they are still typically black boxes and prone to um, relying on spurious correlations in data set. They are fragile to adversarial attacks and they can exacerbate discrimination. So we need explainability for um, debugging and improvement, for fairness and accountability, and for a public acceptance and trust. And for the context, I want to briefly give some of the types of explanations that um, are well researched. Uh, so one of the a very researched type of explanations is based on features, feature importance. So um, we want to um, uh, give weights to how much each of the input feature is contributing uh, to the prediction. Another type uh, is based on instances in the training set. So for an instance, we want to find which instances in the training set have mostly influenced the prediction of the model on this test instance. There's all, also concept-based explanations where a user can define its own concept and um, uh, ask if the model is relying on that concept for um, the prediction on an instance. There's also surrogate models where we are trying to fit a meta model uh, to a neural network uh, where the meta model is a bit more interpretable um, to the users. Um, and there's also the natural language explanation, which is an emerging direction. And this is what we are going to see in this talk. Um, so what are neural networks with uh, natural language explanations? So we want to build models that um, first of all, learn from uh, natural language explanations that justify the ground truth labels at training time, and also are able to generate such explanations for their predictions at deployment. So for example, a self-driving car uh, will not only learn from the environment and the instructions of the driver, the, the, the actual actions of the driver, but the driver could also tell the uh, car why it has taken those steps and the car could learn um, those explanations and from those explanations. And at deployment time, if the passengers ask why the car has done something, the car can um, uh, answer in natural language and reassure the passengers. Um, and this could be applied to uh, different uh, domains uh, such as medicine and so on. Um, so some motivation for, for this type of, uh, of models is first of all, us as humans, we don't learn just from labeled examples. We ask a lot of questions and the explanations we get uh, are helping us improve our model. We probably also uh, in certain tasks learn from less examples because we have explanations. Um, second, uh, a lot of the works in explainability and a lot of the types of explanations that I mentioned earlier are also um, a lot focused on post hoc explainability. Um, so the model is already trained and then we use explanations that uh, to help us spot certain problems of the models, but we don't have a generic way of making the models bypass these problems and not learn these spurious correlations, for example, uh, during the training time. So uh, explainability could also be um, of help here. And um, also um, natural language explanations are arguably uh, or should be the most human friendly explanations, especially for lay users. But even uh, for uh, specialists, um, it could be difficult to interpret uh, certain types of um, more um, graph-based or number-based explanations. And a recent study in 2020 showed that even data scientists overtrust and misuse some of the uh, current interpretability tools. So hopefully natural language explanations would be 
um, a bit more uh, a human interpretable and easy for us to understand. So the ingredients would be, uh, we want to have at training time uh, natural language explanations for the ground truth labels, and we want to build uh, architectures that uh, allow the models to learn from these natural language explanations and to generate such explanations. Uh, so in the first work, um, we will see um, uh, of one of the first and uh, one of the still largest data sets of natural language explanations, uh, two types of architectures of uh, models that are learning from and generating explanations, um, and a quick glimpse into uh, spurious correlations and natural language explanations. So I'm abbreviating natural language explanations with NLEs uh, in the slides. Um, okay, so the SNLI data set is a very influential data set in natural language processing, has been introduced in uh, uh, 2015, and it consists of more than half a million data points um, that have each a premise and a hypothesis, and um, they are in one of the three possible relations which would be entailment if the premise entails the hypothesis, contradiction if the hypothesis uh, contradicts the premise, or neutral if uh, non, nor entailment nor contradiction hold. Um, so what we've done was to take this existing SNLI data set and annotate it on Amazon Mechanical Turk with uh, free form natural language explanations for these relations. Uh, so, for example, if the premise is two women are embracing while holding to-go packages and the hypothesis two women are holding food in their hands, we already knew this was an entailment and we collected an explanation that holding to-go packages imply that there's food in it. So this is what uh, ESNLI is and um, it has uh, a more than a half a million uh, instances in the training set for which we got one explanation for each instance and about 10,000 explanations in each dev and test for which we gathered three different explanations for each instance. And because um, collecting free form natural language um, on uh, a platform like Mechanical Turk is quite challenging for, for the quality. We used uh, certain quality control techniques. Um, so one of them was to actually require the annotators to first highlight the most salient words, um, either in the premise or in the hypothesis. And then we asked them to use those words uh, when they formulate the explanation. So uh, this is to put them in the right mindset so that they have to select the most important words. And also these uh, selected words are also part of the, of the data set that's released and could be uh, used for other things like guiding the models or um, uh, looking at how well attention aligns with um, salient tokens and, and, and other purposes. It wasn't the main goal, but it's, um, it's a byproduct. So we also used several in-browser checks uh, to make sure that they are highlighting words, they are using the words and a few other checks for uh, quality control. Um, so now, uh, after, after we collected the ESNLI data set, we looked at the uh, most typical architecture on SNLI, which uh, usually uh, encodes the premise and the hypothesis um, into feature vectors that were then combined and passed through a fully connected uh, um, MLP and get the label. So this used to be the one of the very typical architectures um, on SNLI and we wanted to make uh, a modification, a more straightforward modification to incorporate um, the explanations, which was to um, uh, just add a explanation generator module on top of the uh, final feature vector. Uh, but we also want to explain the predicted label. So we pass the label 
to this explanation generator. So this was the most straightforward architecture and we call it predict and explain because uh, the uh, explanation is conditioned on the, on the prediction. Um, however, uh, a drawback of this type of architecture is that the explanation, even though it's conditioned on the label, it might uh, um, generate an explanation that it's not, um, uh, uh, it's not really reflecting uh, the, how the model uh, took the decision of that label. So for that, we wanted to put the explanation as a bottleneck between the input and the, and the prediction. And um, we do this by first generating the explanation and then uh, conditioned on the explanation only we generate the label. And we call this type of architecture explain then predict. Um, so we um, uh, instantiated our uh, sentence encoder with a BLSTM with max pooling and the explanation generator with an LSTM or sometimes with LSTM with attention. And so we have these three models now, the first one that's, that has no uh, explanation uh, and the second one, they explained and predict. And then the third one is, um, sorry, the second one was predict and explain. And the third one explained and predict. And for the third one, we also have the two types of um, explanation generators. So with or without attention. So these are quite baselines, but we wanted to see uh, what they are capable of doing. And the results we got, uh, so if we look first of the, uh, the label prediction, we, we run this model with five seeds. So we are giving the uh, average performance and in parentheses, the standard deviation. So we see that um, the task performance, so the, the label accuracy um, was um, 84 for the no explanation model. And when we add the explanation in the predict and explain fashion, we get almost the same thing. So there's no uh, decrease in, in accuracy, uh, but now we got explanations. And then we, we looked at the perplexity and blue scores, but um, they are not necessarily reliable. At least the blue score, um, it's, it's quite unreliable we found because we looked at the uh, blue score uh, between the three explanations that we have in the test set, uh, in the Devon test, and we found um, a blue score that was uh, even smaller for the inter annotator than for some of our models. Uh, and clearly um, the, uh, the explanation written by humans were better than those produced by the model. So this is why we, we um, concluded that it's better to actually manually evaluate the explanations uh, and see uh, how good they are. So we look at the, the first 100 explanations in the test set and we gave scores uh, on how uh, good the explanations were and uh, we could give intermediate scores from uh, zero to one, uh, especially in the case of entailment, we, um, there, there could be multiple bits that need to be explained in order to have a complete explanation. So uh, we gave intermediate scores um, if the explanation wasn't complete. So this is how we ended up with this, um, uh, fractional numbers at, on the column of explanation at 100. And um, this is how correct the explanation were. So we see that only uh, almost 35% were correct in the predict and explain. But then when we do the explain and predict uh, type of architecture, we see uh, that we have a drop in, per, in performance and task performance. So we get to 81.6.7% uh, accuracy from 84. Uh, but now we have better explanations up to 64%. Um, so we, we uh, unfortunately see a trade-off uh, between uh, task accuracy and explanation for this baseline uh, type of models. And now if we take a look at some generated explanations, 
So um, we, are have, we, we see the premise, the hypothesis, and the goal label. And then in each column, we see um, uh, the prediction and the explanation generated by each of the three types of models that ex, uh, generate explanations as well. So the first column is for uh, predict, then explain. And in brackets, we see the, um, the score we gave. To, to the generated explanation. So zero means a bad explanation. Um, 0 0.33 means that there were three arguments that we needed to conclude entailment and only one was given. And uh, one would be um, a totally correct explanation. So we see, first of all, that the explanation do look, um, they don't look too bad. <laughs> but they do miss the point uh, sometimes uh, quite in a, in a pity way, let's say. So if we look at the middle one, uh, to b uh, the explanation would be perfectly correct if only one word uh, was uh, correct in, in, in all the centers. So instead of um, pu uh, firemen are putting out of a subway station, if they were saying that uh, the firemen were coming out of the fire station, that would be perfectly correct. But uh, as is, it, it wasn't, and we annotated it with zero. But it's, um, they, they, they are um, a good start for, for this baseline model. We show that it's possible to have models uh, generate uh, explanations um, even with baseline models, with the first type of models we tried. Uh, and then uh, what we knew about SNLI is that it's, uh, it's full of spurious correlations, that there are many works that are showing that. And one of those works shows that if uh, the models would look only at the hypothesis and completely ignore the premise, would, st would still get to a 67% accuracy. Uh, so again, this is with three labels, so it's quite a good accuracy. And they noticed um, a lot of correlations such as certain words correlating with, uh, uh, with the final label. And so this, um, we, we looked at this architecture as well. So we took the same sentence encoder and we only used the hypothesis and got the label with 67% um, accuracy. And then we wanted to see if what happens if instead of the, uh, sorry, there's a typo here in the second column is not label, is explanation that's generated. Um, so we want to see now, can we get the correct explanations from the, by relying on the same spurious correlations? And we actually only get 6% correct explanations when relying only on the hypothesis. And that is good news because it shows that it's almost a, an order of magnitude more difficult for models to generate the correct explanation by relying uh, on uh, spurious correlations than to generate the correct label. And it's good news, it's probably not surprising because generating an entire sentence, a correct sentence, um, uh, it's more difficult than generating a label. Um, so it's not surprising, but it's confirming that if we have a model that generates the correct natural language explanations, uh, we can probably trust it more than a model that just has high test accuracy. Um, so the data set and the code are publicly available. And uh, there's been um, much more works since uh, then on, on this data set. And uh, the explanation correctness has increased uh, at least to 90% now. Um, and, but there's still a, a lot more to do with this data set. Actually, in the paper, there are a couple more experiments that I, I'm not describing here, but uh, we checked, uh, for example, how well are the explanations helping uh, um, do uh, helping models to get better sentence embeddings uh, for downstream tasks and how are these models generalizing to um, to other data sets of uh, entailment uh, than uh, the ASNLI one. Um, so now I'll go to our second paper which um, is uh, introducing 
uh, a very similar data set, but now for visual textual understanding. So that's why it's called ESNLIV, which is uh, the largest visual language data set with natural language explanations. We've also noticed that there was um, no consistency in how people evaluate um, uh, such uh, explanations on such data sets. So there now has been uh, a few papers in, in this area as well, but they were inconsistent in the evaluation. So we have the first benchmark for such tasks. And we do uh, also an evaluation of um, a lot of automatic metrics on natural language explanations. As we saw that the blue score is not reliable, we wanted to see if other metrics are more reliable. And we also introduce a, um, a new model uh, that's the state of the art across uh, the three data sets we looked at. Um, so to start with, in uh, 2018, um, there was a work that noticed, uh, well, in SNLI, the premise was actually a caption of certain images in Flickr. So let's um, replace the textual premise with the image and uh, form the SNLI VE data set uh, that now has an image of premise. Uh, there is no more textual premise and then there's a textual hypothesis. And uh, again, there's the three labels um, of internal contradiction and neutral. So this is what this uh, work proposed. And it was also presented at a workshop at New Reefs 2018. And what we did was, OK, let's build even more on top of this. Let's add the, um, the natural language explanations from uh, ESNLI. But we also noticed that there's need for some corrections to be made because especially in the uh, neutral labels, uh, in neutral instances, um, the image actually has more information and it could um, become easily either entailment or contradiction. So we see here that um, the person doesn't look at all like repairing the garage, it's just merely staying in front of the garage and so this would most likely be a contradiction uh, than a neutral. And there are many, many more such examples. So uh, we build the ESNLIV, again, starting from the SNLIV, adding the explanations and doing some corrections. So what are these uh, briefly, what are these corrections? Um, so first we did a manual re-annotation of the neutral instances in the dev and test set using Mechanical Turk. So um, we just asked again the, uh, the, the workers to tell us which uh, relation it is between the image and sentence and give us a new explanation as well. Um, we, we look uh, also at um, uh, whether, because the uh, caption, like we said, the premise in the SNLI was a caption of uh, an image from Flickr, but this image had actually five captions in total. So we thought to look, uh, are other captions uh, uh, giving some um, information about uh, the, whether the hypothesis is indeed neutral. And we find that often um, we got some uh, good uh, um, uh, keywords, like for example, they are smiling in the sunlight, so they are not inside a church. Uh, or open air, so again, not inside the church. So we use this to, to filter out uh, the wrong neutrals in the training set. So because we manually annotated the dev and test uh, uh, sets, but the training set being more than half a million, we, we try to do more uh, manual, more automatic um, uh, cleanup on it. We also use another keyword filter um, for uh, explanations that use certain words that are specific to, to text. So um, it is already mentioned. This was more when the, the premise was text or keywords like sentence or the premise says and so on. So um, we, we eliminated the instances where the explanations use this kind of, um, of keywords. And we also use a similarity filter. So 
uh, we look at the explanation and see if it's very similar to what we knew was the textual premise, then it means that the explanation is really tailored for the textual uh, entailment rather than the visual uh, uh, textual entailment. So we, we use this kind of cleanup and we got the final product, which is um, the ESNLIV having uh, 400,000 instances in the train set and about um, uh, 14,000 in the validation and test. Um, and we also uh, wanted to see how good the explanations are, especially um, given that we've uh, uh, mapped them from textual um, uh, explanations. So we looked, we put it on Mechanical Turk together with other uh, data sets um, that also have explanations. So that would be VQAX and VCR. And we asked um, annotators to, to tell us for the ground truth labels as well, uh, for the ground truth explanations as well, whether they are good, yes, or, or okay, weak, yes. Uh, and then they are not good at all, no, and weak, no. Um, it's um, uh, not extremely bad, but also not very good. So we got the statistics for, for this as well. And we see that, um, even though it's uh, mostly automatically gathered and by far larger than, than other data sets like VQAX, which is an order of magnitude smaller, um, it's still not that much worse um, uh, in terms of its, the correctness of the explanations. Um, so then we looked on uh, evaluating the uh, natural language explanations generated by uh, models uh, on applied on these kind of visual uh, textual tasks. And we first noticed that in the literature, there's no, like, like I said earlier, there was no consensus on, on how to evaluate. So sometimes uh, they were looking at um, just whether it's correct or not, or a scale of correctness, or whether it's better, same, or worse than the ground truth. Uh, we didn't uh, have the same number of samples or the same number of annotators. And so we wanted to have um, a unified evaluation framework so that when people want to compare models, they can do it easily. Um, and also, uh, we, we were looking as well into automatic metrics, but we found, and we will see this a bit uh, later, but it's quite intuitive that automatic metrics would not perform that well because um, arguably the generating natural language explanations, it's even more, uh, has, even, has even a bigger variance than uh, machine translation because there can be very different uh, arguments that are equally correct uh, for explaining a prediction, but they are not uh, synonymous. They are not paraphrasing. They, they are completely different arguments. Um, like here we have that the predicted explanation for is the woman happy answering being yes is that she's throwing her hands in air in celebration which is a pretty good explanation. Uh, and the ground truth was uh, that she has a big smile on her face, which is another valid explanation. And you can imagine that looking at blue score on any other metric that's trying to compare the two will not give a good, um, a, a good uh, answer, um, a good evaluation for the predicted explanation, although it's a very good one. Um, so uh, the, the benchmark basically wants to be, a re, like I said, a, a reusable and unified framework for evaluating natural language explanations uh, based on human evaluation, because for now the automatic metrics would not uh, be very good. And uh, we took 300 samples for each uh, model on each data set. Uh, we used three annotators, for instance, and um, for every um, for every instance, we uh, gave to the uh, annotators 
both uh, the generated explanation from a model and the ground truth from the data set. And this is because we, we, want, to, uh, we want to, first of all, see how the annotator would rate uh, the ground truth as well, uh, because some annotators may be more strict than others and uh, might, made, uh, might give a, a lower score to a perfectly good explanation because they are more rigorous or the other way around. So we wanted to have this um, to see how uh, they would rate the ground truth and also to sort of condition them, put them in the state of mind, have, have, a, have, a, have a sort of um, point to, uh, to, think, to think about what would be correct. If they see a more correct explanation, they would also uh, judge better the generated one if they see the ground one. So we've always put these in pairs and uh, we ask them to rate between these uh, four uh, scores between no and yes, uh, whether the explanation is justifying the, the answer. Uh, and so we compared four models on three data sets, uh, which I will um, present here. So the data sets we used, um, so we used two existing data sets and the one we introduced. So VCR uh, was uh, introduced in 2019 and it's quite a challenging data set of uh, visual common sense reasoning uh, and it even uh, gives, the data set itself comes with um, predefined uh, list of explanations be because it's considered quite difficult to be, for the explanations to be generated from scratch, but we actually treated it as a generation and not as a classification a task. Uh, and then we use the ESNLIVE that we uh, introduced earlier and VQAX, which was probably the first data set of natural language explanations in 2018. Uh, so, but it has uh, some, uh, fewer numbers of data points and some of them are also quite trivial. So you see here, uh, if you say that the person is snowboarding, well, the explanation, you, you could give that explanation even without looking at the image. It's snowboarding because there's a snowboard and a snowboarding outfit. Or you, you don't really, you may not even need an image to give that kind of explanation. So also this is an advantage of our data set, which is um, a bit, uh, like it's not as trivial. You do need the image to, to give the answer, um, but it's also not necessarily as complicated as the VCR one. Um, and for the models that we looked at, so we looked at three existing models um, uh, that we call, one of them was called PJX and uh, then we called F FME from Faithful Multimodal Explanations, the second one, and RTV. These were existing models, which basically use a visual language backbone, um, uh, that's uh, made up of uh, ResNet plus um, another module like um, bottom up or BERT or so on for the language part of the visual language task. And then on top of that, we add an explanation generator. Um, so the existing models use an LSTM or GPT-2. And then we um, uh, added a new model um, which we called uh, EUG. Uh, it stands from um, UNITER, which uh, is the currently best model for visual language tasks. So without explanations, just um, solving the visual language task. And uh, we used on top of it GPT-2, which is a very powerful language model. So we, we simply combined the two and uh, got that this model is actually performing uh, better than all the other models on all the free data sets. So here would be the result. So we see in the first graph, we, we gave the percentages of yes, weak yes, weak no, and no that we gathered from uh, Mechanical Turk. Um, 
and maybe it's uh, easier to to uh, see the results in the in the actual um, table uh, on the on the right. So SE is um, a, a score that we give on the explanations. Uh, ST is uh, which is an aggregation of the four um, of the four answers. So yeah, yes, weak yes, weak no, and no were given scores. So uh, and then aggregated, and then we have ST is the score on the task. So it's accuracy um, for for the label task, and then SO is an overall score that incorporates both SD and SC. But um, we see that on all, on all these um, data sets, we have EUG performing uh, sometimes by far uh, better than the existing ones. And it's, it's not surprising because we use the best visual language uh, module and a very powerful um, text generator. And now I can see some uh, qualitative results. Uh, so on ESNLIV, we have the image and we have the hypothesis. Uh, so um, a dog is playing with a cat. There's nothing like that in this image. Uh, so it's a contradiction. Uh, we um, then have what the, each model has generated. So PJX said the dog is not a cat, which is a bad explanation. Uh, and the same uh, for the FME model, and then, uh, and actually the same for all the other models, and only our model has said that a dog is not a football player. Um, so it, it identified that, well, we are actually talking about a player here, a human. It's not the best explanation, but it's much better than the other three models. Um, and we have a similar example here for a neutral case where we have a lady working in a store, but we don't know whether she's the owner. Uh, and uh, we see that the uh, EUG model is actually pointing that out, that it's working in the store, um, which is uh, a nice um, uh, thing to say uh, to, to, to enhance trustworthiness. Uh, and uh, well, it's not really the case for the other explanations to uh, uh, point this out as well. Uh, and here are a couple of more explanations uh, uh, for the uh, VCR task now. Um, so in the VCR task, the, the uh, actors are referred uh, in terms of numbers. So there's the first one, two, three, and what is one doing? One is confronting three, uh, and um, uh, PJX would say that the explanation would be one is looking at three with a smile on his face. So that's quite the opposite of confronting someone. <laughs> so it's quite a, a bad explanation. Um, then uh, we have EUG saying one is facing three and speaking with him. Maybe not sure if perfect, but um, it's actually what we see in the image. We don't, we maybe don't even see the confrontation per se. Um, okay, so there, there are more such uh, explanations in, in the, uh, we gave more such examples in the, in the paper. Um, and uh, then we wanted to know what's actually wrong with the wrong explanations. Um, and we asked the, while, while the annotators were giving their scores, we also asked them uh, what uh, we gave them some options of what can be wrong with the explanation, such as it's untrue to the image, or it's lacking a full justification, or it's a nonsensical sentence. And so this is a, the percentage of problems. So the lower, the better. So again, we see that EUG is much better at mapping um, explanations to what's actually in the image rather than PJX, uh, so with 10 uh, score, 10 points more. Um, lack of justification, uh, they are more or less the same, um, the models, and then uh, in terms of generating nonsensical sentences, again, EUG was the best of avoiding this problem. Uh, and not necessarily other models, uh, even almost twice as bad the FME. 
So uh, we also look at the same uh, problem for the ground truth uh, explanations in the data sets. And we see that all of them uh, have some percentages of problems like this, even in the ground truth. So that's maybe not surprising that the models also learn a little bit of that problem since it's in the uh, data sets as well. So there's room for improvement there too. But again, it's, it's quite hard to uh, crowdsource free text, correct free text. Uh, so that's also a challenge to, to overcome. And then we also wanted to see whether explanation can help increase task, per task performance, which is one of our motivation for this type of, um, of neural networks with natural language explanations, like I said at the beginning. So uh, if we have also the explanation that gets back propagated in addition to, to the label, then we have a valuable signal that gets back propagated. And so the model should learn better. And we uh, briefly looked at um, what the models will, would do if we train them only for solving the task. So that's the first column in each of the data set columns, so empty only, or whether we train them jointly with um, explanation. So we, we, we are seeing um, that most of the time uh, we have a, slight, a very slight improvement, which might not be statistically significant in, in some cases. But for example, on VCR, we saw quite surprising gaps, uh, like for the uh, FME model, uh, training it only for the task would, go, would get 35.7 uh, accuracy. And if we add the explanations, it gets uh, almost 49% accuracy. Uh, so sometimes we, we got uh, these surprising results too. Um, but there's still uh, uh, a lot of, uh, I, think, I think we still need models that can take more advantage of the valuable signal in the natural language explanations at training time and uh, eventually learn to do the tasks better and maybe learn to do them better even with less data points, just like we as humans for certain tasks, uh, we learn to generalize much better uh, when we are explained task rather than by seeing more examples. And we also wanted to see, uh, like I mentioned, a lot more automatic metrics and see how they uh, correlate with uh, the human evaluation of the explanations. So we looked at blue, but we also looked at Meteor, Rouge, Cider, Spice, Birds, Coin, and Blood. And overall, we see uh, quite a small correlation uh, with uh, the human annotation. Uh, and um, in some cases, there's no significant correlation at all. So if we look at VCR, the blue score is, is almost zero. Or the, the correlation with the blue score, I mean, is almost zero. And um, uh, the best ones uh, would be a Meteor and Bird score from, from our uh, study. Uh, so uh, again, the data set, the ESNLIV, the code and the evaluation framework are, are all available on GitHub. And we hope people are going to use it to have uh, an, an uniform, to, to, to be able to quicker uh, validate a new model with respect to existing models and use uh, our new data set ESNLIV as well. And the final work I'm going to talk about is um, uh, a work that shows that actually, uh, while these models are very promising and so on, they can, they, there's also things to, to fix uh, with them, like they could generate inconsistent natural language explanations. And we show um, uh, a first adversarial attack for detecting the generation of inconsistent explanations, which is also a novel scenario in uh, sequence to sequence models in general. So uh, what do we mean by inconsistent explanations? So if we have a pair of instances for which a model generates two logically contradictory explanations, 
then we say this forms an inconsistency. So to give an example or a few examples, if we have a self-driving car that it's in the same environment and if the passenger asks uh, the question, why are you stopping in two different ways? Uh, and in um, the first way, by just asking, why are you stopping? The model says, because there's a person crossing. But if then the passenger asks uh, by additionally saying, there's no one crossing, then the, the, if the model, the self-driving car changes its explanation to, I stopped because there's no one crossing, then the model is inconsistent. Um, uh, and we, we have this pair of instances for which we see this inconsistency. Again, the model, if uh, we have a question answering task and the model argues for an answer because let's say seagulls are birds, but then it also, um, if we change something uh, in the input and then the model argues for another answer because seagulls are not birds, the model is inconsistent. Uh, so this kind of inconsistencies uh, could be a result of uh, either of the two undesired behaviors of a model. So either we have an explanation that's not faithfully describing the decision-making process of the model, or if both of them were faithfully describing the decision-making process, then it means that the model relied on a faulty decision-making process for at least one of the instances. Uh, so we don't uh, know which one of the two uh, is, or at least in our work, we didn't uh, differentiate uh, uh, which of the two is for each inconsistency, but I, uh, both of them are undesirable. So what we want is to actually have a check whether models are generating such inconsistency, inconsistencies. So the setup would be that we have a model M that provides a prediction and a natural language explanation uh, that we call EM of X for an instance X. And we want to find another instance X prime for which EM of X and EM of X prime are inconsistent. And the high level approach that we took was that for an instance X and the explanation EM of X, we create a list of explanations that are inconsistent with EM of X. And then for each such uh, explanation in the list, we uh, aim to find an input uh, X prime that uh, leads the model to generate this uh, inconsistent explanation from the list. So we're gonna uh, look at uh, an important thing uh, uh, now is that the inconsistencies could be context-free or context-dependent. So context-free means that no matter what the input is, the, explanation, uh, the explanations would be inconsistent due to, for example, uh, background uh, knowledge, common sense knowledge. So if the model argues that dogs are animals and in another instance that dogs are not animals, that's a context-free uh, inconsistency. But we can also have context-dependent inconsistencies because if, for example, we have um, uh, the context as an, as an image and we see a dog in the image um, and uh, we ask, is there an animal in the image? And the answer is yes, justified by the fact that there's a dog in the image then if we, um, on the same image, we ask a different question, is there a husky in the image? And the answer is no, there's no dog in the image, that is inconsistent. But this kind of explanation would not be inconsistent if we change the image. So we need to uh, make sure that our inconsistencies are true ones. Uh, and for that, we need to look whether they are context-free or context-dependent. So uh, for, to, to account for this, for the context, we actually split uh, the input into two parts. We have a um, context part and the variable part. And basically uh, at the step where we were looking for uh, the X prime, we actually only look for the X 
V prime. So the variable part is what we are looking for and we keep the context fixed. Uh, so uh, as a running example, if we have the context of the image and the variable part as the question on the image, uh, then we only want to find another question for the same image for which the model is going to give an inconsistent explanation. And uh, the first step where we create uh, the list of statements that are inconsistent with the originally generated ones uh, stays the same. Uh, so how do we do this uh, actually first step? Because we also want to do it in an automatic way uh, because it's dependent on what the model have generated as explanation in the first place. Um, so we, we thought of a couple of logical rules, uh, which would be to uh, look at negation and either eliminate or add negation. We can look at also task specific antonyms, which could uh, lead to hazardous explanations in certain tasks. Like if we think of self-driving cars, replacing green light with red light would be um, a task specific antonym uh, that would lead to very uh, uh, wrong explanation, like the, the car continues because it's red light. Um, and we also can think of swapping explanations of mutually exclusive labels. Um, and maybe this example in this slide is um, uh, a bit more, uh, I, it's not necessary to give it now, I will give a better one later. Um, okay, so uh, we, we want, so after we create uh, these inconsistent explanations using this, uh, these rules, we want to find the variable part of the input that would lead the model to generate those uh, inconsistent explanations. So for that, a simple solution would be to train another model that it's mirroring the original one, but for which we simply exchange um, the uh, variable part with the explanation part. So in the original model, the orange, uh, uh, the orange model, it's uh, getting as input the question and the image, and it gives uh, the explanation. And now the mirror model, the blue robot here, it's getting as input the image and the explanation produced by the original model and uh, it's trained to produce the question that has led the original model to give that explanation. So we call this reverse explainer model and it can use the exact same architecture as the original model. So uh, to put this together, what we do is the detailed approach is that we train this reverse explanation model. And then for each explanation generated by the original model, we create a list of statements that are inconsistent. And uh, we did it by using some logical rules. And then we query the reverse explanation model with, with each of these um, uh, inconsistent statements from the list and we get a variable part and then we query the original model with this reverse input formed by the context and the variable part and we get the explanation on this uh, new input and then we want to check whether this explanation is indeed inconsistent with the originally generated ones and in our work, we did it by checking with an exact string match whether uh, the explanation is in the list of generated inconsistent explanations uh, that we did this at an earlier step. Uh, so this is actually brings a novel sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence adversarial setup because there were, in general, there were no um, uh, in general, we would have a predefined uh, label that we want to uh, change in an adversarial setup or uh, in sequence to sequence, uh, I've seen a lot of works trying to change uh, a couple of tokens, like a very small number of tokens uh, in, in the target sentence. Um, but we want 
a full target sentence because for us even one word could uh, be extremely important in, in, in having that inconsistency. So the word not, it's essential. Um, so it's, it's a much, it's, it's a more challenging attack. And another thing that differentiates this uh, scenario to other uh, sequence to sequence scenarios um, in adversarial attacks is that we don't necessarily care for the adversarial inputs to be a, a small perturbation or a paraphrase of the original input because uh, we only uh, we only care that the explanations are inconsistent we may get that that they are only a small perturbation of the original input but it's not a pre-requirement which is usually the case for previous types of attacks um, okay so We've instantiated this attack on uh, ESNLI, for which the context is the premise and the variable part is the hypothesis. So uh, we only revert uh, the hypothesis and we've only used negation uh, in the sense of deleting negations for ex from explanations if they were there. Uh, we didn't introduce them because we didn't want to, um, to have uh, ungrammatical sentences. Uh, and we, we used the swapping explanations technique, uh, which uh, we uh, identified to work very well in the uh, ESNLI setup, because even though we uh, allowed annotators to write any free text for the explanations when we gathered ESNLI, because we gave them examples of, of correct explanations, they tended to use uh, the templates for, um, from the examples we get. So this was not at all enforced, but they, uh, they used those kinds of formulations. So for example, for entailment, uh, they, they typically say uh, X is a type of Y or X implies Y. Or for neutral, they tend to justify with not all X are Y or just because X doesn't mean Y. And contradiction is often of the form uh, cannot be X and Y at the same time and so on. So we, um, we manually identified some of these templates and um, we, we run uh, on the test set. Uh, a match with these templates and we saw that only 2.6% of the um, explanations in the test set, the ground truth explanations were not following this template so we just discarded those. Um, so it's, it's a very good coverage of these templated explanations. But there's a lot of templates so there's still a big variability in uh, the explanations. So um, a running example would be if the explanation for an entail. Hi, Anna. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Since we are running over the time, so could yeah. you just shorten the remaining part? Yeah, so we can leave some time for the QA session. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. I didn't, I didn't keep track of the time. So um, yeah, we, we uh, basically replaced the X and Y. Uh, we identified and replaced them and we have contradicting explanations such as a uh, dog is an animal, it's, con it's inconsistent with not all dog are animals or cannot be dog and animal at the same time. So uh, we took the best uh, model from the ESNLI paper, explained and predict with attention, which had 64% correct explanations. We reversed it using the same architecture. We ran our pipeline and we found um, uh, 443 distinct pairs of inconsistent explanations in the test set, which makes for a 4.5% success rate of, of this adversarial method. And this may sound like a small success rate, but um, we will see in a bit that it's actually quite difficult to spot these inconsistencies otherwise. So here we just see some example of uh, inconsistencies. Um, so the model is sometimes arguing for entailment by saying snowboarding is done outside and other times for a contradiction by saying snowboarding is not done outside. 
and um, we see many uh, similar way um, inconsistency like the sun is in the daytime the sun is not necessarily in the daytime and so on uh, so uh, while we only get 4.5 percent success rate uh, with this adversarial attack we actually tried some manual scanning and we couldn't find any inconsistency by, uh, first of all, simply looking at the first 50 instances in the test set, or even looking at instances containing keywords that we already identified uh, to, to be uh, uh, inducing inconsistencies, like woman, prisoner, and snowboarding. But we, again, couldn't find inconsistencies in the test set. And then we used a data set that have been uh, manually created um, to, to have adversarial inputs by a previous work. And um, the conclusion of looking at that was uh, actually that the explanations were quite robust. So there's more details of that in the paper. Um, but that's to show that uh, the adversarial attack is actually doing something, uh, showing some of the problems. So in summary, we've seen two large data sets of natural language explanations, certain models and types of architectures on them, and um, uh, a glimpse into the spurious correlations and how NLEs respond to that, a benchmark uh, and some evaluation of uh, automatic metrics, inconsistencies, and an adversarial attack. And there's a lot of open questions in this, in this field. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's an emerging field. It's quite uh, uh, new, a, a couple of years ago. So there's lots of things to, to investigate, like, are the explanations uh, faithful? Um, can we use them, leverage them more to increase uh, task performance? Uh, can we do zero or few shot learning of the explanation since it's quite expensive to gather large data sets of uh, natural language explanations? Uh, can we have better automatic evaluation and how useful are the NLEs uh, in increasing public trust and acceptance? So these are just a few. Oh, thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to your questions now. Sorry for taking a bit longer. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, thanks for sharing, Ona, and uh, thanks for our today's audience for attending the talk. So now you can just directly unmute if you have any questions. Yeah. Uh -oh. Yeah, I saw there is a question in the chat. So, so maybe I can repeat it. Um, uh, Stemma say that uh, not quite understand the false neutral tagger in EV, um, um, VIL part. Uh, can you please explain it again? Yeah. Uh, false neutral tagger, yes. Oh, sure. Let me do it again. Right, so um, the, the problem with neutrals was that uh, we have more information in the image than we would have in the textual caption of, uh, of the image. And uh, because we collected, uh, because SNLI was uh, collected from um, a textual caption of the image without the image being given, and the hypothesis was uh, um, was uh, we they were looking at the hypothesis in relation to just one caption of the image, so that's why uh, often there was a neutral because there was not enough information in the caption. But when we put the image, then we get more information. Uh, so now we see that the people are actually outdoors and not inside a church. Um, and what we look at th this uh, false neutral tagger was looking at more captions because the Flickr images came with five captions. So here we found that two out of those five captions were actually giving uh, important information that they are in the sunlight, so they are not inside the church, and they are uh, open air, in open air. So again, 
uh, not inside the church. So um, this is this is how we use the other captions to see if we get the contradiction between the hypotheses and each of these captions. And if we if we found even one contradiction, uh, then we were eliminating that data point. Maybe we eliminated more data points than necessary, but um, we actually found that this was also quite robust. The details of how robust it was are in the in the paper, uh, but we wanted to have a, a good data set, even if we eliminate more uh, more points than necessary. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Donna. So, any any else questions? Um, hi, yeah. Uh, thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, you seem to be mostly focusing uh, on the correctness of explanations uh, when the label is correct. Um, could you say a little more about what happens to the explanation when the prediction is actually wrong? Like, I mean, if the prediction is wrong, you kind of have a hard time to have the right explanation, but isn't like that the most interesting case? You try to understand why the model was wrong. Mm -hmm. that, that's true that we can uh, maybe get very valuable signal from the explanations when the model is wrong. We didn't look at that uh, in this works, but um, it's one of the many open questions and many, let's say, maybe even long, uh, low hanging fruits to be researched in this area. Um, the reason we didn't look at that yet is because um, it's, it's indeed harder to know, is the explanation really reflecting why the model gave the wrong answer? Uh, again, we don't know if these explanations are faithfully describing the inner workings of the model. So I think it's, it's an entire work in itself, how to analyze uh, and interpret those explanations when the answer is wrong. Now, uh, what we looked at is when the answer is correct, is the explanation also correct? Um, and even here, uh, it could be that the explanation is correct, but the inner workings were incorrect, uh, but leading to the correct label. And we again, don't have a way to, to measure that, but at least we look at the correctness. Um, uh, we want models that have a higher correctness when the label is correct. So we want to get to that level first and uh, uh, in parallel uh, to, to study uh, the faithfulness relation and, um, and so on. But um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting open question to, to see how to interpret the explanations and how can they help us uh, when the, the, the label is also predicted wrongly. Yeah, okay, and thanks, Anna, and thanks, uh, audience. So due to the time limit, we may uh, end the, our talk now. And thanks for your attending the um, seminar today. Yeah. So...